son Paul was about five. He came home from a church event, and I asked him, well, what was for snack, buddy? He said, I don't know. It wasn't exactly cheese, but it was kind of like cheese. I know there were crackers. I'm trying to guess what he might have been served. And I asked him, well, were the crackers rectangle by any chance? Was there a little red stick in the package? And did you have to spread on the, the right, not exactly cheese? <gasps> yes, he said, how did you know? Our family is a pretty from scratch family, I guess, and Paul just hadn't been exposed to processed foods much. But still, he ate what was fed to him. Curiously, I'm sure, but not curiosity with skepticism yet. One day, early in first grade, Paul came home bothered. Mommy, when the teacher calls us over to the circle and certain kids sit down on the line like they're supposed to, she says, Good job! But it kind of sounds like she's talking to dogs. <laughs> okay, now I taught in an elementary classroom, so I get it. Teachers have a lot on their plates. Classroom management, super important. But when I went into school myself, it really did feel like her highest expectation was that my son would sit on a line. That day, Paul asked questions. He didn't just eat what was fed to him. Unfortunately, sometimes in our culture, the highest expectation does seem to be that we all just sit on a line. Since childhood, I've been different. It's not like I have a PhD in critical thinking or anything. It's just always been a part of my life. As an adult, thinking critically became even more important because my husband, Chris, had surgery for Crohn's disease two days after college graduation. He almost didn't get to walk across the stage. The surgeon discharged him saying, see you back in seven years. See, that's the average time a Crohn's patient needs to have another 12 inches of intestine removed. In between, the medical world would have expected Chris to be on prescriptions, in pain after most meals, losing weight, feeling fatigue. But we took a different path. Six years later, we were married, had two of our four kids, zero prescriptions, and he had his first big flare. Two months of diarrhea that nothing the doctors gave him could touch. My curiosity with skepticism, my critical thinking kicked in after listening to a speaker. I remember walking in the door, honey, starting tomorrow, you're not eating gluten, grains, dairy, legumes, or sugar. We're gonna fix you. It took two days, two days. Days. His digestion was better than it had been in years. I called our family doctor. Listen, you gotta hear this. I gotta tell you so you can help other patients. I. No thanks. The nurse currently wanted to know if we needed anything else from the doctor. I'm sure she never even told him our story. And my skepticism increased about getting in that line, about eating what we're fed. I looked at my kids, possibly carrying the gene for Crohn's disease, and, and I started to wonder, what if we could help children become better critical thinkers? How do we help them experience curiosity with skepticism? Today's kids become tomorrow's adults, and critical thinking skills are going to take them places. According to the Wall Street Journal, mentions of critical thinking in job postings at least doubled from 2009 to 2014. And yet, 64% of employers still say it's difficult to find new hires with critical thinking skills. So what is critical thinking? It includes perspective taking, empathy, logic over emotion, and the ability to analyze information. The Harvard Business Review has been lauding critical thinking for years. In 2012, Empathy is the most valuable thing taught at Harvard Business School. In 2018, the best leaders see things others don't see. Perspective taking. In 2020, empathy starts with curiosity. And in 2021, radical flexibility requires empathetic managers. My favorite, though, 
is a 2017 study showing that people who know how to think critically have fewer negative experiences in their lives than even people with high IQ. They're healthier, they hold on to their money and relationships better, and they live longer. I want that for our children. People will tell me, children don't have a developed prefrontal cortex, Katie. They don't have reasoning skills. They can't be critical thinkers. I won't sit on that line. I believe parents have an incredible opportunity to build three key habits to lay the foundations so that your kids more easily become critical thinkers when their prefrontal cortex catches up. So whether you have toddlers, feisty seven-year-olds, or preteens, your children will thrive if you train them in curiosity, adaptability, and resilience. My own mother modeled, number one, this curiosity with skepticism, this question asking for me. When I was a kid, she noticed many of her friends had kids with recurring ear infections, while my brother and I didn't. One night, I was so congested, I couldn't sleep. I remember sitting on the kitchen counter, wailing and screaming, no, don't make me. I hated that fake grape-flavored stuff. Remember Dimetaph? Ugh. As she's holding out the spoon in her sleepy haze, she's counting, Katie, five, four, and her critical thinking kicked in. Hmm, that thickens the mucus in the nose, and in the throat, why wouldn't it thicken the mucus in the ears? See, my mom used Dimetap very cautiously, only a last resort when we really couldn't sleep. Her friends weren't as curious or skeptical, which is why it didn't really surprise my mom to get a newsletter from the pediatrician a few years later, like on paper, not an email back in the 80s, saying that new research was reporting that yes, a causal factor in recurring ear infections was Dimetap. What a fantastic model for me at an early age of curiosity with skepticism. Now that my mom's a grandma, she continues to be a great example of the second foundation of critical thinking, adaptability. My nine-year-old son, John, asked recently, did grandma make sourdough bread and homemade yogurt when you were a kid? These are my kids' favorite things when my mom comes to visit. He was flabbergasted when I said no. Yes, yeah, she made homemade cinnamon raisin bread at Christmas, buddy, but we never even ate yogurt. <gasps> Where did she learn all that stuff? Well, actually, I guess she kind of learned it from me, from reading my blog at Kitchen Stewardship and watching me learn new things. I love that my mom is at an age when most people are getting more stubborn than ever, and yet she reminds us all it's never too late to see from a new perspective. Now, can this be done in children too? In my family and in my work teaching kids to cook, I see that children can question the intentions of food marketers and, and understand that real food makes them feel better. Children can see other perspectives and choose empathy. This is 12-year-old Rebecca, who created a special ice pop recipe that wouldn't hurt her little sister's belly. And this is Christian, who painstakingly made a dairy-free fruit pizza with no sweetener to fit his mom's special diet. So we have curiosity. We have adaptability. These are the habits your kids need to build critical thinking skills. Number three, resilience. That's what they need when they have critical thinking skills. Because if most people aren't using the noggin as deeply as they should, I guarantee your kids will have times they have to go in the opposite direction of culture. I see resilience as a muscle that needs to be trained, and that can start young too. In fact, let's do some critical thinking practice right now. Why don't we think about the food served in schools? Curiosity with skepticism might ask questions like, why aren't there any federal regulations on sugar in school lunches? Why does a slushy count as fruit? And why was Trix cereal inside a bag of free government-funded healthy school breakfast? Hmm. My kids start their resilience practice as early as kindergarten because their homemade packed lunches in stainless steel containers look different. 
And you know how kids can be about differences. If only all kids could think more critically. I teach kids to cook because the kitchen is a lab for critical thinking. Watch how this works. This is Kara, who learned through curiosity with skepticism that real food is the best way for her to feel better in the face of her chronic illnesses. She is determined that her kids will be adaptable and learn to cook real food for themselves. So she signed up for my cooking class, Kids Cook Real Food. Here comes the resilience. After lesson one, she said, only one kid cried, one mom apologized, and the toast got a little burned. But she muscled through. By class four, it was so much fun having my kids alongside me in the kitchen. For the first time ever, having four kids in the kitchen felt productive rather than draining. Everyone was contributing. And when the whole family is cooking together, serving one another, what happens next is the single most important factor in a child's life to build that strong sense of self needed for resilience. The whole family sits down to eat together. I'm not just saying this, this isn't an opinion. Research shows that kids who eat regular family dinners are less likely to engage in drugs and alcohol, they're less likely to fall prey to depression and suicidal tendencies, and they're more likely to do better in school. Another of our nearly 20,000 Kids Cook Real Food members, Tanya Kubo, told me about a Friday night when both parents were just done. She said, girls, I'm too tired to cook dinner. Do you want Mexican or Asian? Her 10-year-old daughter, Lily, said, just a minute, Mama, I'm going to go look in the fridge. She came back and announced, I see ingredients for quesadillas. I'll make dinner tonight. With her curiosity, adaptability, resilience, and skills in the kitchen, Lily saved the Cubo family 60 bucks that night, the cost of eating out in California. This story means a lot to me because so many of us default to eating out, either because we see cooking as a chore or because we see eating out as the best treat we can give our kids. What this young child was modeling was that staying in for family dinner was not a chore but a joy. And that sitting around the table together was healthier, more meaningful, and preferable to going out to eat. If your kids are going to build that muscle of resilience, using curiosity with skepticism, if, if they're going to go against that easy flow of culture sometimes, they need an anchor. And that's your family. That's why you eat family dinners. Now, if you're starting to worry that your kids raised to be questioners might question your parenting, first they should, it makes us better. But second, we can build trust and connection when our kids see that we are thinking critically on their behalf. At my daughter Leah's 10-year-old well child checkup, she had to get a routine finger prick to test her cholesterol. The girl was absolutely terrified. She was literally trembling and sobbing in my arms. I said, it's okay, honey, it's okay, we'll just take a minute. Suddenly, her hand is being physically pulled away from us to get the procedure over with. I held out my own. I said, no, we're not doing this today. I'd asked enough questions about health to know that a 10-year-old's cholesterol level, not going to change our lives that day. What was going to change our lives was if Leah trusted me. I needed Leah to know that her body was her body and that no doctor, boyfriend, or other entity would ever make decisions for her body without her consent. And it took my own resilience muscle to tell that nurse, no way, not today, I don't agree. Listen, I don't want you to just agree with what I'm saying today either. In fact, if you haven't been asking questions about everything I just said, you weren't listening very well, were you? I took a minute recently to ask Paul's high school U.S. history teacher, who, who teaches teens critical thinking, what the world would look like if kids didn't build critical thinking skills. He paused, raised his eyebrows, talked about Nazi Germany for a minute, then said, 
if we don't encourage more critical thinking, our system of government is in peril. But, 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 he also tells me the teenagers of today are more interested in critical thinking than years past. They, they have a real desire to see from other perspectives. He tells them on the last day of school that he has a lot of hope for their generation. And I have a lot of hope too, because parents like you are seeing that you can build a foundation for critical thinking in children. And we must, because it matters to all of us. Critical thinking is the key to our children's self-esteem, our family connection, and the future of our culture. Critical thinking will impact every decision your children will make and in turn determine the world your grandchildren inherit. Critical thinking can be developed at an early age by modeling in our families curiosity with skepticism, adaptability, and resilience, by inviting our children into the lab of critical thinking in the home, the kitchen, and by prioritizing family dinners. Elon Musk once said that the single best piece of advice was to constantly think about how you could be doing things better and questioning yourself. So, what questions will you ask your kids today and allow them to ask of you?